Hi, welcome to Senior Moment Successful Aging. My name is Mary Beals Lutka and I'm your host. I'm the director for the Area Agency on Aging with NACOG and you can reach us toll free at 877-521-3500. Senior Moment Successful Aging is co-sponsored by Yavapai College Division of Lifelong Learning and our producer is Connie Del Castillo and you can reach her at 717-7607. Again, welcome to the show and welcome Michael Berlow. Thank you. It's nice a pleasure to, to be you. here. Nice to have you here. Thank mm. you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. So, Michael, you're the director of nursing for Maggie's Hospice and Palliative Care. That's correct. Nice. That's a long title. Yes, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, let's start back a little bit about where you came from and how you got into this um, field. Well, this is actually, a, for me, a second career. Um, I, I'm actually a native Arizonan. Grew up in ah. Tucson. Been in Prescott for the, about the last 24, 25 years. Okay. Um, I was originally an engineer in my previous life, but I found that uh, nursing is really my true calling. Um, spent five plus years at Yavapai Regional working on the med surge floor, love that. Um, diverted out into hospice, worked at, I actually worked for a couple years uh, at our inpatient unit here in town, the Marley House, which is a wonderful um, uh, building and organization uh, with Good Samaritan uh, and then shortly thereafter we started up Maggie's Hospice and we've been running for about four years and I've been their director since we started. Since the beginning. Since the beginning. So wow, From an in what kind of engineer were you? Uh, well, <laughs> it's a whole world <laughs> in its own. I started out in systems engineering oh, okay. and then electrical oh. engineering but I never, I mean I was on the uh, cusp of graduation when I decided that it just wasn't my real true uh, calling, uh, and you found it. I found it. I you know, did indeed. How, you know that's that's great because yeah. not everybody does. Yeah. You know that's like me when I started aging. I didn't grow up thinking I'm going to be in aging, but when I started working in this field, I just you know 27 years later here I am. It's still engaging to me and interesting. So let's talk a little bit about Maggie's um, hospice and some of your philosophies, and then you know talk about hospice. I think there's a lot of misnomers about hospice. People think, oh my God, I can't call hospice. That means I'm, I'm going to die tomorrow. Uh, you know, all those things. And, you know, I, th I guess talking first about, you know, what is hospice? Well, and, and actually this is very fortuitous because I believe November 1st started National Hospice and Palliative Care Month. So mm -hmm. this is kind of our whole promotional time to kind of get that word out. And, and for us, it's really a an educational thing, mm -hmm. trying to do exactly what you just eloquently stated, that it's not about death. It is not about death. It's certainly about um, end of life, mm -hmm. but it's about comfort. Because, you know, people, and, and we do do, hospice does do, um, you know, we do get patients that are dying tomorrow, yeah. but that's not where we really excel. Um, hospice is about making everybody's last day the best day they can be, or last days the best day they can be. And you know, the people, when they hear the word hospice, they say, well, I'm not dying. Exactly. Well, I mean, honestly, we're, we're all dying. <laughs> we all it's are. The question is when, yeah. you yeah. know, and so uh, people that have that discussion or are told that they should probably be on hospice need to understand that we're not there as, you know, the angels of death or anything like that. It's about us helping them have that best day every day for as long as it goes. And sometimes that is two days, sometimes that's six months, sometimes that's a year, sometimes they get better and we graduate them off. So that misnomer about, oh boy, you know, that's it, I'm done, they called hospice, well that's really not what we're about. We're about caring for that patient and making their life better. Too bad we don't have a hospice for life, right? <laughs> because isn't that what it's all about? Living well, every is. day the best we can. That is true. You Absolutely. Know? So it sounds like really folks should get involved with you earlier. Right? And that's, that's really what I wish people would understand is that the way hospice works is that, you know, you know all throughout your life, you, you seek health care, right? right. You, you are diagnosed with the flu. You go to the doctor. The doctor gives you something. You get better. At a certain point in your life, our bodies just naturally age. Mm -hmm. And so you might be diagnosed with something that, you know what, it's just not gonna go away. So at that point you have a chronic illness and that's where actually palliative care comes in and we can talk about that later. But as, as the, you progress, at a certain point the doctor says to you, you know, you, you have something and if things don't change, 
in my best opinion, you have six months or less. That doesn't necessarily mean six months, boom, you're gone. Mm -hmm. It means that, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. But if things continue the way they're going, this is kind of how it looks. That qualifies you for hospice. Right. But do you find that sometimes doctors are reluctant to do that? Yes. and But there's a good reason for that. <laughs> yeah. Because, and, and I, I have no blame towards any medical professional no. in that realm because doctors are trained to save lives. Yeah. That's what they do and they do it well. And so their whole education and their philosophy is let's do everything we can to get you better. Doctors aren't all, and I say that with reserve because some are very skilled at this, but having that conversation about end of life is hard. Yeah, It's hard. And so um, not all doctors are, are at where they could be with that discussion. Well, I think it, it's easier for nurses because we're taught to keep people comfortable. It's true. And take care of them and That's make true. that day good for them. So I think it fits better you know, with, with, with a nurse running it because I think you, that's what we're taught from beginning. In that's true. School. And there are, there are a whole group of doctors now and we, our medical director is one of them that uh, is trained in hospice, certified in hospice and palliative care. And they're, they're very yeah. skilled at having that discussion. And I think we're seeing, um, I don't know, I can't blanketly say as a country, but we're seeing uh, in many communities more doctors tending towards understanding that mm -hmm. and helping people understand that as, as well, we Well, it's certainly progress. evolved since yeah. I was, uh, I started nursing in the 70s, and so it's come a long, long way. Absolutely. We didn't even know what palliative care was. Right. And, and again, we're going to get into that. Um, so if you have, you know, what, yeah, what is an admitting diagnosis? What, well, can you see other doctors? I mean, does everything just end then, or how does that work? No, and so that's kind of the, the whole Another misnomer about hospice is that people think that, you know, if I come on to hospice, I, you know, if you have your primary care doctor that you've seen for the last 20 years, they don't necessarily go away. The admitting diagnosis is just that. It's, it's what we just talked about a minute ago. It's what the doctor says, well, you now have this and mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is not going to go away. And if things don't change in six months or less, this is what's going to be your ultimate um, demise. Uh, and so, so things like cancer mm -hmm. or COPD or congestive heart failure, or there's a, there's a plethora of things that, you know, ultimately you're not going to bounce back from, but that is your admitting diagnosis mm -hmm. to hospice. That doesn't mean you have, you don't have other things. And what I'd like to tell people is, you know, sometimes, for example, maybe you are um, a diabetic and you've been going to uh, an endocrinologist uh, that's been following your diabetes for the longest time, but now you have cancer and you come on to hospice, you can still go see your other doctor. Hospice takes over your care for that admitting diagnosis. Okay. Now you certainly have the choice to have your, uh, our medical director follow all of your care, mm -hmm. but if you're you have a relationship with a, a community, there's no rule that says you cannot continue with that. So, but some why don't some primary physicians follow you on hospice? Well, so each hospice has a medical director, you mm -hmm. know, that oversees the program, and these are physicians that are skilled primarily in end of life care, gotcha. end of life comfort, treating symptoms, uh, and and the reality of it is we are. 24 seven, um, you know, in the two in the morning, the patient or, or the individual is having difficulty. They call us, we come. And so uh, not all doctors like to get that call at two in the morning. Oh, the patient's very constipated. Constipated. Can we give them a suppository? You know, and, and I understand that because yeah. most doctors, most primary care doctors in the community have thriving practices. Right. They work all day. They don't have time to receive those calls. So there are certain doctors uh, that are associated with hospice that are available to us 24 seven. So regardless of the issue, we can call them night or day and they're available to so us. So it's like your specialist. That's right. You that's know, right. it's the same thing, really. Um, yeah. That's how, you know, from what you're saying. But I also wouldn't say that there aren't doctors in the community. There are, in particularly in our community, there are m numerous doctors that will follow. follow a patient because again, they have that relationship yeah. and we respect that. I yeah. want to honor that too. When you've had a doctor for 20 years, you know, absolutely you have a relationship because that's very personal. Right. Very personal. They right. know everything. Yes, they do. I don't know why I tell my doctor <laughs> everything. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, 
poor man. And they um, give it back to you. I remember when you yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so hospice is a general term for, you know, it, it is a, a practice of medicine for hospice. But how do hospice is different? What's special about Maggie's? And, and how are they different when you go to look at um, hospice services? So, so the reality of it is that Medicare writes the rules for hospice, mm -hmm. right? And so we all, we all follow the same set of rules. Yeah, here in Prescott, there are six hospices. They're all good. They are. And we all follow the same rules. So, so really what defines a hospice, when a person comes on to hospice, the way it works is that they are in charge of their care, or the family members and the patient are in charge of their care. So it, we, we bring our nurses out, we bring our, our CNAs out, our nurses assist, nursing assistants out, our social workers, our chaplains, our volunteers, um, and, and they all follow the patient. The patient is entitled to whatever they want. If they only want a nurse to come, a nurse comes. If they want the full gamut, they got people coming every day. Um, we blanket them with support. And so uh, it's all dictated by the need and the desire of the patient mm -hmm. because hospice is voluntary. A person can come on hospice, they can go off hospice, they have the right to switch to another hospice. The bottom line is this is their end of life journey. It should be the best for them and they should have the right to choose. So in my humble opinion, what differentiates a hospice one from another is the caregivers. And the example that I always use is that, you know, like when I worked in the hospital, uh, you know, you come in and you're having your gallbladder removed and you just had gallbladder surgery and you're recovering and you know, you're opening your eyes and the first thing the nurse walks in and she says, I haven't had my coffee yet. Well, you know, it's probably not going to be a very good day for you, <laughs> right? I mean, it's dictated by the care yeah. of the caregivers. So if you have good nurses, you have good CNAs, you have good, you're going to get wonderful care. Yeah. And so I think at least speaking, self-promoting here, um, Maggie's Hospice, we have, uh, and, I, and there are good, again, I don't want to, uh, say negative things about anybody. There are good. All the hospices here are good. Mm -hmm. I just feel that we happen to have the cream of the crop. Uh, we have oh, well over 20 nurses that work for us here in this small community, and I mean, some of them have been ho doing hospice for 12 years, 20 years, 40 years. When I worked at the Marley House, which is our only inpatient unit here in town, we contracted with all the hospices, so I got to know all the hospice workers mm -hmm. in town at the time. So as Maggie's developed and grew, I tried to grab, <laughs> you know, all the best people. And we really have, we have just an amazing staff. But that says something about you, you know, because you've gathered them. And I think it's, you know, to have a leader that believes in, believes in it, you attract that then. You do. Well, and to some, to some respect, and, and again, I'm part of that as a function of what uh, my company allows us to do. We are not a corporation. Mm -hmm. We're privately owned by a nurse, which gives us a little bit more flexibility uh, in that, you know, again, going back to how Medicare sets the rules. Well, the rule is that when a person comes on to hospice, a nurse has to be in the home at least once every two weeks. That's the rule. Mm -hmm. So how do you interpret that? Well, in my mind, it's what does the patient need? Yeah. Maggie's Hospice says, well, we're going to be there a minimum of at least twice a week. And if you need us more, we're going to be there more than that. So maybe other hospices will say, well, we're only going to go once every two weeks because that's what Medicare dictates. So mm -hmm. it's kind of how your organization um, defines that. Decides and, how you yeah, do it. Yeah. So, and, and you were mentioning that they do have an in-house uh, here in, in town, the Marley House. Yeah. But in, in most cases, you're in your own home, right? Yeah, and so, and that's another misunderstanding with hospice. And, it, and it's a common misunderstanding, and I think that goes back to, um, you know, 20 and 30 years ago when hospice started. People think, well, I'm going to come on to hospice and I'll go live in the hospice house. And there, there is no hospice house that you live in. The way the Marley House works, and it works for all the hospices, um, is that we use that uh, for, for several different reasons. You use that for what is called a respite situation. And the respite situation really is not for the patient, it's for the caregiver. Yeah. So, and particularly in our community, we have, I can't even 
begin to tell you how many loving families we have out in our community that's mom taking care of dad. Their family don't live here, it's just mom taking care of yeah. dad. And now moms come on to hospice and dad's not doing well or dad's you know, just worn out from taking care of mom or dad needs to have a bender to Las Vegas or whatever. Right. It's for the caregiver to have a break. And so the patient can go into Marley House and Marley House uh, will take care of them for five days or nice. it doesn't have to be five, but it can't be more. You know, once every other month, they're entitled to that. Additionally, they have a, a level of care called general inpatient care. And that means that if there's some reason that uh, we come out to your house and you have new symptoms, be it pain, nausea, something that we can't control, and we've tried, and we've tried for hours and hours, we can move you over to Marley House under this status and you stay there as long as it takes to get that symptom under control. Okay. Um, and then you go back home or ultimately sometimes people pass there. But um, to answer your question, people, most people prefer to be in their homes, I yeah. think. Oh, yeah. So we service people in their home, in a skilled nursing facility, in assisted living, in a group home, wherever they are, we come to them. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's another thing that I get questions about um, at the agency is that, well, my mom's in a nursing home, but she really needs hospice. How does that work? And they think that they you know, have to move them, or, mm -hmm. but you work with them. We work with skilled nursing facility. We are a complement to their care. And so this is where, ideally, it should be a, even a better thing because they're in an environment where they are receiving skilled care from nurses and CNAs and they have social workers. Now you have hospice and now you have more nurses and CNAs and social workers. And so you should be getting over the top care. The difference is that it's kind of going back to what we talked about with doctors, skilled nursing facilities, most skilled nursing facilities, and because they have rehab in many of these mm -hmm. facilities, are all about people being healthy and getting better. We specialize in comfort. And so we come in and we help. We, we our plan of care uh, jives with their plan of care. We, we, cre we mesh a plan of care so that their caregivers and our caregivers are all now providing that supportive end of life care. So you've got a good, you do your care plan meetings and, and yeah. you, you, you become a, a, a bigger team than ever. Exactly. So what all does hospice cover? And it's covered by Medicare, it's right? It's covered by Medicare. And so here's the other thing that people, I really want people to understand uh, is that uh, hospice is free. I mean, hospice doesn't, you will never get a bill from hospice. People think that, uh, you know, oh, if I have to go to Marley, no, that's all covered by hospice. In fact, if you're 65 or older and you're on Medicare, you have already paid for hospice. It's part of what you've paid into all this time. And I, and I hear this a lot too from um, a lot of our, our older folk that, oh, I don't wanna you know, use Medicare's dollars. I don't wanna use the government's. Well, you've already paid for this. Yeah. It's not like you don't, you deserve this. You've paid for this. It's federal it's insurance that, that you've been buying. That's correct. Yeah. It is your benefit. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's one of those things that people need to utilize because it helps, it really helps with your end of life journey to have this that you've already paid for. So, so you know, know that it's a benefit of the insurance that you currently have. And That's I think correct. if you look at it that way, you know, because we, we get that a lot too. It's like, oh, we don't want a handout. We don't want, you know, and it's like, it's not a handout. Right. And people also worry about, um, whoa, well, then I lose my Medicare. And, and that doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily true in that, you know, you, once you qualify for Medicare, you have this Medicare benefit. When you come on to hospice, essentially what happens is the Medicare benefit stops uh, and the Medicare hospice benefit starts. They're essentially the same thing. It's just where the government is paying money to. Are they paying it to the ER and the doctors in the community or are they paying it now to hospice? And so uh, your Medicare benefit stops, but if you decide at some point, I don't wanna be on hospice, then your Medicare benefit starts right back up. It's not like you lose it, it's just, it's one or the other. So. So just help me understand. So maybe that's one of the reasons folks don't go to their primary physician because if they if their Medicare benefits are all in hospice, then how do they cover outside? And that's where it gets to be a gray a area because yeah. 
If you come on to hospice, again, with your primary diagnosis, mm -hmm. hospice is expected to cover everything associated with your primary diagnosis. Again, if you're a brittle diabetic and you want to go to your endocrinologist, that's not your primary diagnosis. So Medicare still covers. We'll cover that. Yeah. Okay. So when you come on to hospice, I mean, hospice pays for uh, all those uh, caregivers that come into your home, the nurse, the CNA, uh, the social worker, the chaplains, all that's covered by hospice. Medication that's associated with your diagnosis. So again, if you have come on for perhaps COPD, mm -hmm. we cover those COPD medications, which can be expensive, expensive at times, yeah. certainly. Um, and we cover all those medications that we uh, feel are associated with comfort, pain medications, nausea medications, constipation, whatever it takes to keep you comfortable, that's all covered by hospice. Uh, along with that is the bigger global picture of comfort, and that's we, we cover equipment. So if we have to bring in a hospital bed or a walker, wheelchair, um, any associated durable medical equipment, that's covered by hospice too. So it's, it's kind of this whole package that comes in and when a person... Uh, so, so if they need something that's not part of that diagnosis, Medicare will still take care of it. I, and I can't, I don't want to swear to that, but yeah. in many cases that's it will. true. Okay. Yes. So, but but yes. the hospice staff, you and your staff will be the ones, you know, really coordinating really everything, that's it sounds true. like. And that even applies yeah. to medication. So people feel that, again, you come on to hospice and you're on for COPD and we're covering your COPD meds, but again, you're diabetic. Well, you can still get your insulin and all that stuff the same way you always got it through Medicare. Okay. It's just not covered by hospice. Gotcha. Yeah. So here's a hot question for you that you are not expecting. No. <laughs> so is this opioid crisis? tethering you at all? Are you having any problems with it? Because well, yeah. here you are, end of life, and, and it's such a hot topic right now. Yeah, and I, uh, wow, and I see that from two different perspectives uh -huh. because I'm, I'm also uh, a student right now in, in pursuing my uh, family nurse practitioner license. Oh, okay. So as a potential provider, yeah. I see it from one perspective. From hospice, I see it in another perspective. Yeah. The opioid crisis is not not necessarily direct bearing on hospice. On hospice, the medications that we use, and, and we are very uh, diligent. Uh, and, and again, to, for people to understand, our goal is not to sedate you, not to uh, put you out so that you don't feel it. Our, our goal is to make you comfortable. Yeah, right. And our doctors are very skilled at doing that. So we are very diligent about our nurses come into, our, into your home, we're counting our meds mm -hmm. because not so much that we're worried about abuse and so forth, but we want to make sure that you're not running out and that you're always comfortable. So we maintain a pretty good uh, accounting of the medications that we prescribe, probably more so than anybody else in the community. You know, and my concern is not is not that. My concern is that hope I hope that I hope that um, because of the crisis that people don't over legislate and make it hard for you when you're trying to work with pain management. So I didn't know if that had affected you at that this point. That is a big concern of all of us. Yeah, ours. Because, I mean, you know. But I also think that the government understands um, what we do and the nature of what we do. Yeah. And, and we are kind of a subunit of all of that because quite honestly, you know, all the studies show that when a person comes on to hospice, it really, it saves the healthcare system immense amounts of money. And I think that's a really important point. That it, it really does, it does, you know, because there comes a time when you choose, okay, I'm going to get all the tests possible, I'm going to keep getting treatment, I'm going to keep doing all this stuff, yet I'm not really comfortable going through that. And so the alternative then is to hospice, is I want to enjoy what life I have left. Every day is important. And, you know, it does cost a lot more to do all that other stuff. Right. So I would hope, in, in that, in the, in the bigger global sense of things, that as we move forward as a nation, that the government continues to see that uh, the value in what mm -hmm. we do in end of life care. And again, opioids are a part of that yes. because until there's a better solution, alleviating pain from cancer, I mean, that's, that's what we have. Yes. That's what we have and that's what we do. And so uh, we are also very diligent about when a, when a person ultimately passes away, we destroy medication. So we're not leaving it out there. So I think, you know, that it is certainly an issue in our society, but I'm hoping that our portion of it is not 
adding I to hope that. so, too, and, yeah. and know that you have an advocate here for that. Thank you. Because I spend a lot of my time in advocacy, and that's just been in the back of my mind a little bit, like, hmm, I hope that that doesn't tie your hands. Um, and then let's talk about wh what's palliative care and what the difference is. Well, okay, so again, I'm just going to paint that picture again. Uh -huh. So, you, you know, you're born, and all through your life you have... Uh, health care mm -hmm. and again you can have the flu you go you get a shot or whatever they give you some medicine antibiotic you get better and then boom you reach that point where oh my gosh I've got something and it's not going away uh -huh. it doesn't mean you're gonna die a lot of people get diabetes they get COPD they get congestive heart failure and they can live a nice long healthy life mm -hmm. but this this ailment that they have is never gonna go away the key here now is treating it and again keeping your life as best and positive as you can and having a healthy life so mm -hmm. um, uh, again someone who comes on with COPD now the, the doctor gives you inhalers and and medicines to keep mm -hmm. so that you can breathe and maybe you have issues once in a while when the allergies here kick up in town and so forth but again your body continues to decline so now that COPD over time gets worse the goal of palliative care really is A, to keep you comfortable, B, to keep you out of the ER. So the way palliative care works is that a doctor or a nurse practitioner comes to your home perhaps once a month, perhaps maybe twice a month. It's like having a doctor house call. And so they come to your home and they say, hey, what new symptoms are you having? Let's look at that. Let's treat that. And so now you've got somebody there that's managing your symptoms and you're not critical you're just you're just trying to live your best life you can right. but we're keeping you out of the ER because it's not getting to that point where you're there's this big exasperation and now you're calling 911 so palliative care is just a new it's not new but it's a big wave that's sweeping across the nation and here in Prescott we are very very fortunate because uh, not only does our hospice do palliative care but the hospital has this remarkable program where they have doctors inpatient doing palliative care and they have doctors outpatient doing palliative care. Because nice. they see the need in our community as a senior population that we can really serve this community best by bringing the care to them. And so, Absolutely. Yeah, and so again, people don't, it, it, the way palliative care works is it again is a thing that you've pretty much already paid for. It's almost as if the doctor again is making a house call. In some cases, your insurance will cover it 100%. If you have a copay when you go to the doctor, that's what you have when you have palliative care. When you have palliative care. care. So yeah. you do do both. You do hospice and palliative care. We do. Thank you we for do. spelling out the difference because I think sometimes that gets mixed up and people don't understand what that is. And, you know, I really appreciate you being here today to talk about hospice, to talk about Maggie's and, and what you do because you obviously have a passion for it. Oh, well, thank you. You know, make thank every you. day special. Is there anything that I you want to say before we close? Um, no, I get, well, yes. Actually, I would just want to say to people, uh, you know, you never know. Again, we, we mentioned right. that everybody everybody's going to get there at some point, but you never know when that time is going to come. Please, please have Watch discussions out. with your family, with your loved ones, about end-of-life care and what you want to have happen because you never know that you might have a stroke or whatever, and then you aren't able to then tell Then you're not people. able. So I, I call it your yeah. Declaration of Independence is doing your living will and your advanced directives. Yes, I think please. they're really important. So Michael Berlow, thank you so much for coming My today. My pleasure. And thank, thank you for joining us today on Senior Moments Successful Aging. I'm Mary Beals-Lutka. Until next time.